My name is Scott Trent, <clears throat> and I'm an artist. I'm not really sure what that means. My son, August, is an artist, and we, say, we uh, put his artwork on the refrigerator. For me, it means I usually don't get paid for my work, and I have to have a second job to pursue the art. <laughs> In 2012, I stumbled onto this experiment where it gave me some insight into what it means to be an artist and the challenges that artists face and actually what it looks like to really explore creativity and look for that inspiration. And I call that the year I fed the coyotes. When I, uh, before I tell you about that experiment, though, I want to tell you some insights that I've gotten over the years. Um, and there's a few examples of what this looks like. Um, for me to be an artist is, um, constantly, well, let me, I'm sorry, let me tell you this. The first time that I pronounced in front of a group that I was an artist, I couldn't believe how much that it surprised me, how difficult it was. It was almost like there was an obligation or responsibility to, by me saying I was an artist. And throughout the years, I've noticed these challenges and different things that continually surprise me. Like, for instance, the courage to be creative. I would have never thought that that was something that I had to worry about. It began when um, I used to take pictures of audiences that I was speaking in front of. I got into this habit, and it was a, a photography class. And I was interviewing to be an instructor for the photography class. So I had my camera with me, and I took this picture. I don't know if it'll surprise you, but I didn't get the job. So say cheese. <laughs> but so with that, I got into a habit where I would take pictures of audiences. And as just as a glutton of punishment, every semester I'll take a picture of the class I'm teaching. <laughs> the problem is every time I look at these pictures, I realize like I got to work on my presentation skills. <laughs> but one, one incident that just, I couldn't believe how difficult it was. At the end of my academic career, I was defending my dissertation. So I was standing in front of five of my committee members. And if you asked them, they would say they're the smartest people that I knew. And they were not in a good mood. They were there earlier than they wanted to be. They had to read this long paper that I wrote, which I guarantee you half of them didn't read. They didn't look at me when they walked into the room. They weren't smiling, and I brought my camera because I wanted to take that picture. And I couldn't reach over and grab it. I couldn't take the picture because they held my academic career in their hands, and I was afraid to push against protocol or change the mood or do something that would say, ah, Trent, you're down. No PhD for you. And that stuck with me all that time, how much courage it takes to be creative. I founded the uh, Henderson Art Project in 2009, and during that project, I had numerous times where I could explore the challenges that artists face and this constant dialogue, conversation that goes on between the art and business or the art in the street. Uh, when we placed this sculpture on the street, there was a tenant in that space. About halfway through, the tenant moved out. So what does the business owner do? He puts up a sign. He's got to lease his space. He's got to make money. But it just so happens that the best place on the street is right in front of that art. So who's right? Does the businessman put a sign there? Or does the art bring something that justifies not having a sign blocking it? I created a work of art that I uh, submitted for an outdoor exhibition. It was at a high-end retail shopping center in Dallas. And the piece on the left is the sculpture that I submitted. I returned a week later, and the piece on the right is what I found. Now, the event coordinator was worried about people getting too close to the art, that it might fall over, that it would be unsafe. And his solution, which he was very proud of, and it, it's beautiful, he built this black box, painted it, put cinder blocks on top of the base, mulch on top, Problem solved. The problem as an artist is no longer my work of art. 
Matter of fact, it's a collaboration between me and the organizer. This was a collaboration with uh, James Bauer and Pascal Pryor. We created this sign. In numerous conversations I had with the building owner, they said, we want to have our address. We want it to be big and bold so you could see it from the street. And we want it to be artsy. We want it to be creative. I'm like, cool, we can do that. After a couple conversations, I realized that I could maybe slant the zero just a little bit, <laughs> and that was going to be good for them. That was their creativity. That's artsy. <laughs> so we were very pleased with it. We thought it turned out nice. And uh, a week later, I got a call from the client. And he said, Scott, our financial partner has looked at the sign. He says, it looks broken. You need to come fix it. <laughs> We fixed the art for them. I was lucky enough to serve as the artist in residence for the city of Frisco. I lived for three years out on this property. It's an undeveloped, uh, 5,000 acres of undeveloped land. It was me and my three dogs and some of our friends. Uh, the snake on the left, if you can't see that, that's seven to eight feet long. I almost stepped on it as it was going up the tree and that was on a tree just outside my window. One of my dogs developed allergies while we were out there. And as you might know or not, you have to, you start looking at all these different things to help the dog with allergies. So one of the things is you get rid of the food that they're eating. So I found myself with this large bag of dog food. And I guarantee you, I made the decision that I know every one of you would make. It's like, hey, why don't we feed the wildlife, <laughs> right? Specifically in my case, I wanted to feed the coyotes. Now, I'd never seen the coyotes, but I could hear them every night, just out in the darkness, over the edge. You could hear them yipping and howling. It was, it was haunting at times and beautiful at other times. So why not feed the coyotes? And that's what we decided to do. I found a spot just outside the fence, right outside my office window so I could watch. And people said, Scott, this is crazy. You don't invite wild animals onto your property. They're going to eat your little dogs. And all I could think was, really, you think those coyotes aren't coming on the property because I haven't invited them there or put food out? And then the other thing that I realized was I was just a guest on this property. As I'd watch mice and snakes and a tarantula walk across the inside of my house, it's like, I have no control out here anyway. <laughs> so we fed the coyotes. And I realized that creativity is very similar to this, that sometimes people feel if they ignore it or they don't acknowledge that they're creative, then they're not, and it's not there. And it's what I know as an artist who embraces creativity, but I see creativity in everyone, even whether it's picking out the right suit in the morning or fixing that ideal meal at night, you're creating. And I believe that living is creating. I remember seeing her the first time as she was coming up to the food, she'd eat real timid and look up, never trusting the environment. They would come in pairs often, never more than that. And I saw eight to 10 different coyotes that would come at different times of the day. One day, uh, one morning, I was walking out to my studio and I looked around the edge and there was these three or four little pups chasing each other, jumping up and down off the bells of hay. Uh, one afternoon, taking a break, I look out the back of my studio, and I could just see these two ears, just above the brown swaying grass, looking closer, and there she was, reclining in the sun, her nose up to the breeze. It was just, it was amazing. And what I realized during this time is that if you feed, if you feed your creativity, that's where the inspiration comes from, very similar to uh, feeding the coyotes. I started seeing them and, and it brought this vision that I didn't have. I had to stop feeding the coyotes. I'm an artist. As I said, I work two jobs so I can be an artist. And as soon as I quit feeding them, I didn't see them again. I knew they were still there. I could still hear them. I, just out, just beyond my vision, out in the darkness, they were there. <clears throat> Now, 
The thing that, um, and this quote is actually perfect, but the, I'm losing, sorry, I'm losing my place here, that is what I want to tell you is that when, the thing that amazed me most was this vision that I felt like I had gained, that I had this privileged view of the world that I didn't have before, simply because I fed these coyotes. And I realized that creativity is very similar to that, that you have to feed your creative soul if you want those inspirations. And I also realized that day-to-day -day routines and obligations get in the way of us seeing our creative soul. And then the quote that I kept going off of is Schrodinger really said this well. And he said, it's not so much to see what no one has yet seen, but to think what nobody has yet thought about that which everybody sees. That's what the artist does. So how do you feed your creative soul? And when do you, uh, when do you feed the coyotes? And the thing that I know is that artists understand the courage and the foolishness that it requires to create, that they either struggle through it or they embrace it or they find that strength to get out there and do things that aren't easy to do so they, they can express themselves and express that creativity. And the thing that I know and I've seen and I've actually experienced is that society benefits when the artist is able to create. Thank you. Thank you.